In my previous video on the Bristol Buckingham, I mentioned that even before the start of World War II, the British had recognised that the aircraft they had in service were going to be outdated in short order. Nothing special about that. It was, and pretty much still is, recognised that as soon as you prototype a new aircraft, you need to start thinking about upgrades and its future replacement. This was especially true in the 1930s, when aircraft and power plant development was hairing along at a breakneck speed. In fact, things moved so fast that even the most optimistic projections of the aircraft manufacturers and procurement agencies were left trailing behind reality. And because cutting-edge technological advances often hit significant snags, well, you get plenty of failures along the way. This, in many ways, is typified by today's aircraft, the Vickers Warwick. But despite the issues it faced, it actually went on to play some very important roles, though now it is practically forgotten. The origins of the Warwick essentially start with a British Air Ministry specification issued all the way back in 1932. This requested a new twin-engine bomber that would have to carry a substantial bomb load further and faster than anything else flying. The giant Vickers concern rose to the challenge and, with the combined genius of their lead aircraft designer, Rex Pearson, and chief structural designer, Barnes Wallace, they created what would become the Wellington, an aircraft that proved a stalwart throughout the Second World War and which was the most produced British bomber of the conflict. But even before the Wellington first flew, the Air Ministry was seeing the rapid pace of aeronautic development, especially in engine design, and decided that they needed to jump the gun to stay ahead of the opposition. Policy was now to build a substantial bomber force as quickly as possible for strategic use, and so in 1935 the Ministry went to Vickers and said, Can we have a bigger version of this please? Now this would seem eminently logical. As essentially an expanded Wellington, the Warwick shared several components with its smaller sibling and the design work on both was able to run in parallel. Additionally, when the Warwick went into production, the Vickers workers would be intimately familiar with the building of its complex geodetic structure from working on the Wellington, and so this would help transition the production lines to the new and more formidable heavy bomber. Indeed, the creation of the Warwick should be comparatively straightforward, it was thought. All that was needed was a reliable and powerful engine to hoist the new heavy bomber and its bomb load into the sky. And the British had just the thing, the new Rolls-Royce Vulture. Regular viewers of the channel will likely recognise that name, because several of the forgotten aircraft I have featured owe their demise to the failure of that particular engine. But credit where credit is due, the British authorities and Vickers recognised that they were putting all of their eggs in one basket with the Vulture, which was already expected to be heavily committed to the new Avro Manchester bomber. So a second prototype was ordered in 1937 with an alternative power plant, the Napier Sabre. Again, regular viewers of Forgotten Aircraft will recognise that name as well. If not, check out my video on the Martin Baker Mark III fighter. Because the Sabre, which would ultimately develop into a reasonably successful engine, also experienced a very troubled development cycle. And this soon became apparent and led to another change, this time to the second prototype Warwick, so that it would instead be equipped with the Bristol Centaurus, a new and powerful British radial that would provide the oomph the Warwick needed if the Vulture failed to deliver. As it was, the third time also wasn't the charm certainly initially, because the Centaurus would have its own share of issues in development. By now it was 1939, and the supposedly simple expansion of the Wellington that was the Warwick was in serious trouble. It was much heavier than had been projected, and basically didn't really have an engine. Serious thought was given to cancelling the aircraft, but ultimately the British at the time didn't have a new heavy bomber design available, with the big four-engine heavies like the Lancaster and Halifax still being at the proposal and preliminary idea stages, while the Manchester had serious issues. Plus, the British were still keen on the idea of using twin-engine bombers, because they would represent a considerable saving in production time and costs. So the Warwick was reprieved, and in August 1939 the Vulture engine prototype flew for the first time. 
And in the best tradition of the Vulture, this lasted just a few minutes before an engine fault made it necessary to put the aircraft down in short order. Once repaired and flights resumed, it became apparent that with the Vulture, the Warwick just wasn't any good. Thought was given to developing a four-engine variant, but this was quickly shelved, and attention switched to the second prototype with its Centaurus engines. In April 1940, this first flew, and showed to have much better handling and performance. The problem was, as said, that the Centaurus wasn't in production, and it would be in fact several years before quantities for Warwick production would be available. Then, somewhat ironically, the fall of France provided the Warwick with its salvation. The French had ordered large numbers of combat aircraft from the United States, which were swiftly transferred to the British after France's capitulation, as well as large numbers of supplementary engines. And amongst these were orders for the new Pratt & Whitney double WASP radial. These weren't as powerful as the Centaurus, but they were available and could be used on the Warwick, giving it an expected performance at least comparable to the then mainstay Wellingtons, but with greater payloads. So in January 1941, an order was placed for 250 Warwick bombers, composed of 150 Mark I's equipped with 1,850 horsepower double WASPs, and 100 Mark II's with 2,500 horsepower Centauruses. But again, things were slow. Somewhat understandably, the USA had their own increasing requirement for double WASPs, and so the first Mark I wouldn't get delivered until May 1942. This was far too late, and the RAF were already using four-engine heavy bombers on missions, aircraft that had far better capabilities than the Warwick. The order for the bomber Warwicks was cut, with only 16 of the aircraft built, and both the RAF and Vickers were now faced with an aircraft on the production line that was no longer needed. Ironically, this would lead to the Warwick being both extremely useful and being built in several configurations, though despite this, it is thoroughly unappreciated by history. The first step was to quickly convert 13 of the Mark 1s into C Mark 1 transports for use by the BOAC airline. These had their gun turrets removed and fared over, and flew routes across the Middle East where the Warwick's long range was a definite asset. Indeed, despite some reliability issues with the double wasps, the Warwick's proved successful enough as a long-range transport that another 100 would be built for use by the RAF as long-range cargo and passenger planes. These, the Warwick C Mark III's, were fitted with a cargo pannier under the fuselage and could carry 3,044 kilograms of cargo, or 24 men and their equipment, or else up to 10 personnel in a VIP configuration. But though these were useful enough, they were just a fraction of the service the Warwick would provide. The remaining Mark 1s, which actually would end up having their numbers ordered boosted, would serve as specially converted air-sea rescue aircraft. This particular service had been largely ignored before and in the early years of the war, with the rescue of aircrews downed in the waters around the UK initially being the responsibility of high-speed launches operated by the RAF. This was rapidly found to be utterly inadequate, and with aircraft needs for other roles so desperate, the initial air rescue teams got saddled with things like Bolton Paul Defiant turret fighters that were bodged up with inflatable airdroppable dinghies under their wings. These were perhaps marginally more successful in this role than they had been as fighters, which really isn't saying much, and the RAF employed a range of aircraft in the job before, in 1943, deciding that the Warwick was just about ideal. Its long range and large carrying capacity meant that it could carry several sets of life-saving gear, composed of either a number of Lindholm gear sets, an entire airdroppable dinghy, or else a mix of both. The Lindholm gear was a rather ingenious setup that was made up of five canisters joined together with a rope, which composed of a self-inflating dinghy in the centre container, and the others holding food, dry clothing, and survival gear. The rescue aircraft would drop the gear upwind of the ditched crew, which would then, if it worked out correctly, drift close enough for them to grab a rope, pull themselves into the dinghy, drag in the emergency supplies, and await rescue. And I say was, but modern versions of this equipment are still in service today. The other item that many Warwick ASRs carried was a Fox's airborne self-writing lifeboat. These were wooden boats that housed two engines, mast, sails, radio, survival rations and dry suits, as well as an instruction manual on how to sail, and in the later versions, could carry ten men. 
dropped from a warwick at 700 feet. The Fox boat would drift down on six parachutes and, when it hit the water, would shoot out lifelines on rockets for the downed crew to grab onto and board the boat to await rescue, or else even make their own way back to shore. All told, 275 of the Warwick ASR Mark 1s were built, which were followed by another order for Warwick Mark 6s that featured an improved double wasp engine, and of which 94 were built. Between them, the ASR Warwicks equipped 14 RAF rescue squadrons and played a substantial part in the rescue of more than 13,000 persons plucked from the seas around the UK during the war. But the story is not quite finished there. Remember how I said that the hope had been to fit the Warwick with Bristol Centaurus engines? Well, once they became available in numbers, that is just what happened. And while the double wasp equipped engines were suitable for non-combat roles, with the Centaurus, performance went up enough for the Warwick to be thought suitable for combat once again. The GR Mark II was intended for reconnaissance, anti-submarine work and torpedo attack, being equipped with a surface search radar and capable of carrying either two 21-inch or three 18-inch aerial torpedoes, or else bombs or mines up to a rather impressive maximum of 12,250 pounds, though I'm pretty sure that they never carried that full load operationally. However, the extra horsepower caused stability issues with the aircraft, and remedial design and construction work had to be carried out before they could get into service fully. The 188 GR Mark II's built were followed by another 210 GR Mark V's, mainly for patrol and anti-submarine work, which reduced the payload but added a lee light under the aircraft for illumination. Most of these aircraft would ultimately go into storage as surplus to requirement as the war in Europe drew down, and the fabric skin of the Warwick wasn't considered suitable for their deployment to the Pacific but a number did serve with Coastal Command through 1944 and 45, patrolling European waters on long, boring anti-submarine missions that may have not had much glamour or often proven very exciting, but which were important in the context of the bigger strategic picture. And that pretty much sums up the career of the Warwick. It wasn't flash or glamorous. It didn't level cities or fight epic battles in the sky over enemy territory. It bimbled around doing its job, normally one that doesn't get a lot of ink spilt over it, but which was critically important. And here at Military Matters, we love planes like that. Because while much of history has forgotten the Warwick, for any air crew bobbing forlornly in the ocean, praying for rescue, the Warwick was the most significant and beautiful aircraft they would ever see.